Good morning. Are you excited to be here? Good. I'm excited to be here. Are you excited about power-packed parenting? Uh, not as excited as I am, but hopefully that'll change you here in the next 45, 50 minutes. I'm going to look at five parenting PowerPoints, okay? Now, if you did nothing else in your life after today but applied these five things, within a week your life would be different, and within a year your family would be completely different. You know that? And yet, you're thinking, oh, this is great. Carolyn's coming up with five new things for us to do. I'm not. These are five things you've heard. If you've not been here before, this is all new. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of new to go away with. If you've been here before, this isn't anything new. And some of you, when I share, you're going to go, oh yeah, well, you see, this is impossible. Our family can't do that. Is it impossible? Is it impossible? Our theme, nothing is impossible. You know, Restoration International, we didn't just kind of come up with those words and kind of put them together and think, oh, that sounds kind of nice, we'll do that. Where did we get it from? Word of God, Luke 1, 37. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. With who? With God, nothing shall be impossible. Matthew 19, 26, but Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And I looked at, that was King James, but in the Message Bible, this is how it puts it. I don't go there very often, but sometimes it's valuable. It says, Jesus looked hard at them and said, no chance if, all, if you think you can pull it off yourself. Every chance in the world if you trust God to do it. So if you're here thinking you can pull this off yourself, not a chance. If you think that by God's grace you can pull this off, every chance. You know, do you believe that? What about him? Those of you that are looking at this guy, does he believe nothing is impossible? What do you think? Hello? Okay, how many of you, I need to see hands now, how many of you have done what he's doing? Raise your hands. If you've actually been there on one of those numbers, is it, is, do you believe nothing is impossible, those of you that did that? Absolutely, nothing is impossible. I'm going to just, I'm going to obviously need to get you warmed up on the whole nothing is impossible theme. So I'm going to grab some paraphernalia. I'm so excited about all this stuff here. And many, how many of you know what all this stuff is about? Absolutely. How many of you have done this stuff? Okay, not many. So I'm going to give you a little initiation. There isn't any way to do this elegantly, and I'm not going to wear this because I'm not dressed appropriately, and I've tried to find a way to pick this up that you'd go, oh yeah, I see what she has. This is a climbing harness, right? And you put, your, you put this thing around your waist, and your legs go kind of in here and through here, okay? And then on this thing are all kinds of loops, and you would hang some of these carabiners on there. I don't know if I can pull them all, I'll pull the whole thing apart, but anyways. They hang on there, and then all of this metal equipment hangs on there because this guy here, can you see the loops in the rock, children? And he's connecting himself to those loops with a lot of this gear, and he has to wear that. And I know one young man here takes this down every night and puts it away in case it would walk off on its own. It's heavy stuff. And when you're doing this number, you're not just climbing up there trying to defy gravity. You've got all this weight around you. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. In fact, let's talk about it now. Eric. Eric appeared, he was born in 1968. This wasn't a long time ago. Well, okay. Boys and girls, it was a long time ago. For me, it was in my lifetime. There you have it. Eric, born September 23, 1968, appeared like any other healthy newborn baby boy. He had two older brothers, and he was, you know, born into this family. Everybody was really excited. But after just a few weeks, his daddy noticed something was wrong with Eric. And when he was looking into Eric's little face, he saw that his eyes couldn't focus. And Eric's eyes were just all over the place. And his daddy, he, he called his mommy, the mommy over, and he said, Hey, have you noticed Eric's eyes? And they looked closer. Something wasn't okay with baby Eric. And a long story later, and several years' worth of doctor's appointments and investigation found that Eric had something rare called retinoschisis. It was the destruction of his retina. At that point, it was clear that he couldn't see properly already. And they told the parents, sad to say, that by the time he's a teenager, he will be completely blind. 
that's a pretty devastating outcome, isn't it? To be told that your infant baby boy will be blind in his teens. Pretty devastating. You know, as a parent, you begin to think about all the things your child would have done that they're never going to get to do. Pretty awful. You know, Eric's parents were determined that this son of theirs was going to live as normal a life as it was possible for a blind boy to live. And Eric's mom figured, I don't know how many years of sight my son has left. I'm going to make the most of every minute from my son that when he becomes blind, he'll be able to act like a, like a seeing person. Wasn't that a smart thing to do? Wouldn't you want to do that if it was your boy? And so she taught him things like, she said, you know, when they came home from the store, Eric had to put all the groceries away when he was just a little boy. That's kind of mean, isn't it? No. And Eric had to put them all away in such a certain way and a certain system. And if he didn't do that, his mom took them all out of the cupboards and he did it over because she was teaching him order and system. Because when you are blind, you need that big time. He learned to fold the white socks one way and the black socks another way. So when he's in his drawer, he could figure out which ones to put on. All kinds of things his mother taught him to try and lead him into normal life. They fought to send him to a normal school so that he wouldn't be classed as a castaway and a handicap for the rest of his life. When Eric was 16, tragic, tragedy hit his life again. By 13, he went totally blind, by the way. That was devastating for him. They th he thought at least in his later teenage years it might happen, but by 13, he was totally blind. When he was 16, tragedy struck his home. His mother was killed in a car accident. You imagine that. She'd been the one who had drilled it into him. Eric, you can do this. You can do this. And now she was gone. And in his kind of desperation and loss of what to do in life, he ended up at a blind camp. And there was an instructor there who was teaching blind kids to rock climb. What do you think to that? Kind of crazy. He says himself, I've seen him on, on YouTube, and he says, I thought they were totally crazy, teaching blind kids to rock climb. Well, anyway, he tried it. And he didn't try it on a mountain at first. He tried it on a climbing wall, you know, where there's all those little knobs and things on there, and you learn how to go up there. And he began to realize that he could see with his fingers. And he was there, and there's pictures, and he's flailing around, and he's, he finds the hold, and his fingers told him everything his eyes would have told him about what he was doing. And he became a remarkable rock climber in his early 20s. You know, sometimes in our parenting, it feels like we're kind of shooting in the dark and we're trying to raise our children blind, doesn't it? You know, it feels like we don't know where we're headed, where to put our next step. It's an uphill journey. Getting to the top seems impossible and we're going to have to step out in the darkness. There's so many beautiful parallels to this story. Eventually, Eric moved on from climbing, climbing walls to mountains, and he had friends that climbed with him. And instead of being a handicap to them, he became a fully functioning team member. Sure, they had to warn him there's a cliff edge here and there's a whatever there, but he learned a technique to climb blind. So much so that Eric climbed Mount McKinley in Alaska. Eric climbed the, I think it's called the, the, the Dawn Wall, the um, El Capitan in Yosemite. He climbed that blind. Eric climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. And I think we're going to have a picture, hopefully, if the PowerPoint is working. Here is Eric. Who knows where he is? He's on Everest. Can you believe that, friends? He was in his early 30s, and he managed to climb Everest blind. And we say it's impossible. Friends, nothing is impossible. I want you to think about Eric as you're looking at all of this and seeing all of this stuff around us. He was surrounded by disadvantages. You know, sometimes we say, you know, yeah, but you know, in my parenting is different. You see, I'm surrounded by Everest. I've got to climb every day. And I'm disadvantaged. I, it's not that you may be blind, but I didn't have good role models, you see, so I can't. And, and, and I'm a single parent. And, and you know, well, my family, if they were like them, then we could. And these are all excuses because nothing is impossible. Do you believe that? Because I've got to get that clear before we can go any further. <laughs> before we can get into power pack parenting, you've got to be convinced that it's possible. Because if you're not convinced it's possible, I may as well sit down. <laughs> I'm not going to do that, though. So there you have it. <laughs> Remember, Matthew 19, 26, but Jesus beheld them and said, with men, this is impossible, isn't it? But with God, all things are possible. So PowerPoint number one, 
the most significant parenting thing that we could ever do, and you're like, what is it going to be? Is worship. Worship. Yeah, worship. Worship is like this. And I, and I already messed around up here so that I wouldn't take this thing totally apart. This, I want to equate worship in parenting to the rope in climbing. Now, you may look at this thing. This is several layers thick, but if we kind of broke it out, this is how thick this rope is. What do you think about that? You're going to hang your life on that thing? Yeah, because those of you who have climbed know this is no ordinary rope. This is highly technical stuff. It's not going to break. And I've got to say to you, you know, when Eric climbed Everest, he was attached to this. You know, would you, would you even think of doing this and not be attached to a rope? Not if you're thinking straight. And yet how often in our Christian experience do we try to go through our life and we try to raise our children and the rope is right there and we don't connect into it? And we're just going to do this thing blind. We're just going to do this free climb. We're not going to do the rope thing. We don't need the rope. Friends, we really need the rope. If you walked out of here today, you did nothing else for the next year but applied PowerPoint number one into your lives and your family's life, you would be totally different people. Do you know that? And there is no question. Worship. We go through our hours, days, weeks, months, and years sometimes without really connecting to God through in a spiritual way in our hearts and therefore to the lives of our children also. So before we can talk about child, children's worship, we need to talk about ours. Our children need to see us having personal worship. Amen? Good morning. <laughs> Just checking you're still with me. <laughs> our children need to see that. This is the most important event of our day. The most important event of our day is personal time, one on one time with God. And when we don't do that, and we get to the end of the day and we're wondering what went wrong again, because I know we've all been there and had those days where again and again we seem to do the same mistakes, we go down the same negative track, and we don't want to go there. And why do we go there? Nine times out of ten, because we didn't have personal worship with God. Not personal, meaningful, going to change my life today worship kind of a thing that I'm meaning. We need to be connected. We need to tap into the power source. In Mark um, chapter 1 and verse 35, it says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Who was the he in that verse? Jesus, thank you boys and girls, Jesus, did you know Jesus was the Son of God, Jesus is our perfect example, and every morning what did Jesus do? He had devotions. If he needed devotions, how much more do we sinful human beings need devotions? We need, friends, we need our time with God. We cannot get by without it. Now this message is not really about we the parents. It's about power-packed parenting. How to get away. <laughs> Don't like those guys. <laughs> how to raise our children. But if we want them to do something, do we need to set the example? If you want to be successful, we do. Most definitely. So let's get into children's devotions. Proverbs 8 and verse 17 says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. There's two kinds of early, and they're both applicable. Early in the day and early in the life. And if we're older in the life and we haven't started devotions, and you're here saying, I never heard about personal devotions, it doesn't matter. Start today. You won't get any sooner than today. Start your day today and the rest of your life today. So when should we start teaching our children to have personal devotions? What do you think? Do we wait until they can walk? Would that be reasonable? Or when they can read? I mean, that sounds reasonable. Or maybe when they start school? Or maybe when they want to? What do you think? Or should it be earlier than that? Earlier than that. Our children, especially when they are tiny, their minds are like sponges, and they will just soak up whatever comes. And sad to say, because we're in this world with X number of years of sin in this world already, we are all inclined to soak up the wrong rather than the right. 
So we need to just pile the good stuff into the minds and the pathways of our children so that, and we saw this in our own children, we so soaked their minds with godly stuff that the devil would come along and it, it was like he just, there was no room, there was no, no more soakage left. He couldn't get soaked in because they were already soaking in the good stuff. And so I'm going to ask the, the team up there, I'm going to start calling on you for images now. I'm going to call on you for image number two. See if we can get that up there. Thank you, that was perfect. Number two, what we started when our children were, I don't even know that they were two weeks old, probably more than two days old, but not any more than two weeks old. We started to play them. Now, what you're seeing up there, the first picture, we didn't play it then because actually they sing on that CD. So, <laughs> But we played the ones behind there on the table, back there, the resource table. We have lots of different music, lots of different scripture songs. Over the ABC, he has lots of different scripture songs. And when our children were infants, in the matter of the first week or two, in, in the mornings and when they would go to sleep, we played them scripture songs. And you could have said, well, Carolyn, I mean, have they ever told you what they thought about that? Well, they were only like weeks old. They couldn't tell me anything. But I was going in faith because nothing is impossible. I said, okay, God, I'm going to put into their brains as much as I can of you. And so they would wake and they would sleep listening to the scriptures being sung to them. And I challenge you, if you've got tiny ones, try it out. Work with it. See what happens when you do. I'm going to put, ask you to put up in image three now. Image three, my Bible friends. Now, they don't have them over here, but typically you can get those at the ABC. These are the, there's, there's two different kind of books in Adventism that we're used to for children. The, I call them the red-spined books. That's these, my Bible friends. There's the blue-spined books. We started our children off, and they used these for years. They are the most beautiful stories. And when they were really little, we read the stories. In fact, we read them so many times that I can memorize some of these stories even now. You know, small donkey, trick trot, a small donkey. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> top of the hill, there's Bethlehem. You know, the, you know the drill. <laughs> we read those to our children so often when they were just little, tiny, tiny children that by the time Hannah was two and Caleb was coming on the scene, she she could do her own devotions. Do you know why? Because she could turn the page and she, it was almost like a tape recording in her brain because she knew all the words that were on that page and she knew when to turn the page because she'd heard us read it so often. And how do we know? Because she could tell us the stories, but she couldn't read, but she was telling us those stories. And we used those books until the children were, oh, I don't know, maybe maybe three, maybe even up till four. Such precious books. And then if we could have the next slide... Then we began to use something else. Oh, that is the same slide, but it's really good. We'll have the next one. <laughs> we need slide number four. Perfect. Anybody familiar with Thy Word Creations? Fantastic place. If you're not familiar, we don't have the resources, but that's why you need your program. Write down Thy Word Creations on your computer, on your phone. If you Google that, you will go to their website. And they have numerous books which are, which are portions of Scripture. So you saw, I think the picture was Isaiah 53, and then there's Psalm 23, and 1 Corinthians 13. And at the age of three, Caleb learned to sing the entire chapter of 1 Corinthians 13. And I'm being honest, I was skeptical. When I listened to it, I thought, oh, this is so boring. I mean, I mean I'm just being honest. It's so drab and dry. They'll never learn this. I was rebuked. Within three weeks, my three-year-old was singing all over the house, 1 Corinthians 13. And within about three months, so was I. <laughs> it took me a little longer. In fact, we used to, you know, church is further now, but years back when we, church was about an hour away, we would try to see at what point on the road we would finish 1 Corinthians 13 from when we started leaving our driveway. And it was different each week, but it, you know, it got to be in fun. And then, then there's the Ten Commandments. And so for their devotions, they would put in the CD or the tape back in those days, and they would listen to that. And we would talk about it. We would use it in family worship too. That was what was going on when they were around about the age of three. And then we're going to have image um, five. My Bible first. I wish I could have got a better picture of there of my Bible first, but I didn't have means to be able to do that. How many of you are familiar with My Bible First? A lot of people. Excellent. If you are not, Google My Bible First in your computer and you'll find yourself available to 
a ton of resources, fantastic resources. So from the earliest age, our little ones were, were familiar with My Bible First. And by the time they were around five and six and they began to start being able to pick out words, we would help them to pick out those words in their personal devotions. This is all their personal devotions that we're talking about, okay? And then as they got older, they could fill in the little blanks on the little pages. And My Bible First has a lot of resources besides their lessons. There's pictures that they can color and little activities that they could do. And I'd photocopy these pictures during the week as part of their personal devotion time. And we went through, My Bible First has, you know, it start, they, it's pretty much a three-year cycle through the Bible for every level. And I think the, the kindergarten primary, Hannah did it three times over. That was nine years worth. What a blessing that was. Caleb wasn't so many because we kind of, he was always had to move on a little before his time because his sister was moving on. We went through the junior system and I think we did that one and a half times through. It's a fantastic education and it's not just about Sabbath school. Use it for their personal devotions. Then you haven't got to come up with all these ideas all the time. Somebody else already did and it's excellent material. We're going to look at the last slide now. Um, number six, Conflict of the Ages series. What? For their devotions? For their devotions. Don't let people fool you into thinking that your children won't need or won't have an interest or a desire in spirit of prophecy till they're in their mid to late teens. Because that is the devil's plan. I'll tell you why. Because by the time they get to their mid to late teens, there will have been enough peer pressure around them to say, you don't listen to that old fogey stuff. That's from years gone by. It's not relevant to today and you've missed your opportunity. Now, if that has happened, don't give up. If that has happened, you can, put, you can pray for a love for that in the heart of your child. But if you have young ones, it, it, there's, there's never too soon a time to start. So, Caleb was six, and along with the My Bible First lessons, they each, in each lesson they show you which bit of patriarchs and prophets, prophets and kings or whatever they're referring to. And so, on this particular occasion, the week was Moses Strikes the Rock. That was the kind of theme of the week. And they had the particular part of Patriots and Prophets that that was going to be about. And so I had him listen. Remnant Publications produced those that I showed you up there. You can Google them. I know, I don't think they have them today at the ABC, but the ABCs do stock those. They are the best audio version of the conflict series that I have ever heard. Really fantastically read, very engaging. And our children from six years and up, and I only started at six because that's when we got them. So Caleb at six was listening to Moses Strikes the Rock, and I thought, I wonder if he's really listening, you know, or is he just kind of zoned out, and he's just doing time in his devotions. And so as we dried dishes together, I said, son, tell me about your devotions. And he'd been listening to Patriots and Prophets, and he began to tell me, and I can't remember the example he gave, but I thought, whoa, I never heard that before. And I thought, hmm. Being a mom, I'm going to check him out. You know? So after, after we'd done dishes, before he was getting on with school, I went to the book, and sure enough, he had heard something on there that I had missed all these years. Praise the Lord. So I encourage you, there's, it's never too soon to start a, a love in your children's hearts. You know, and by the time Hannah was 10, we had bought her for her personal devotion, Steps to Christ, large print. You can get those guys, big, you know. Large print, and then she wanted Desire of Ages, large print at 10 years old. We bought that for her. Please encourage your young people. If you are enthusiastic about their devotions, if you are saying, you know what, you're going to really like this, this is going to be really good, and you're, you show the positive, they will engage in devotions. And friends, there is nothing more powerful for your children and mine than connecting their hearts directly with heaven. Half the work you are trying to do will be done here if you connect their hearts to him. Well, we've got to start as soon as we can start and make it practical. Okay, we're going to move on in worship to family worship. When the, the climbers are climbing, and particularly as they climb Everest, they are linked together by rope, okay? And there's a reason for that. Certainly, especially on certain areas where they're traversing certain areas, they are linked together because if one falls, the rest will hopefully be able to save him and they won't all go to their death. Family worship is a bit like that. The point of family worship is so that we can be connected together as a family. We know each other's weaknesses and strengths, and we can help one another. It's a great opportunity to reinforce their personal devotions. And oftentimes in worship, when our children were little, we would ask them, so what did you do in your devotions? Or what if they hadn't done anything? Got nothing to share. So 
it was a good idea to have made sure they did something in their devotions that they could have something to share. And we didn't just ask, what did you do? We asked, what did you learn? Because I, I can do my time, but what am I learning? So we would ask them, what did you learn in your devotions? Child Guidance, page 520 says, in every family there should be a fixed time for morning and evening worship. Friends, I didn't come up with this idea myself. It's a God idea. From way back in Bible times, the children of Israel, they had morning and evening worship, and this is where this comes from. When Hannah was six months old, and I'm, some of you are going, yeah, I've heard these stories before, but there's a lot of you that are new, and I'm, so I'm trying to span the age range and span the information range, if you will, for, for the different people that we have here. When Hannah was six months old and we began to do family worship, she'd been having her personal devotion time with the scripture songs, and now Paul and I sat her between us, and we're bringing her into family worship. And at the time, we were studying Desire of Ages together. And so we sat her there, and we had the book between us, and Hannah was thrilled about family worship. Oh, she was, you know, she was messing with the book, and we were horrified. We were brand new parents, and you know, we were horrified. This isn't meant to happen in worship. Hannah, don't do that. Well, what was her problem? She didn't have a problem. We had a problem. Let me tell you, because it went on the very next page in Child Guidance. If you haven't read it, friends, you've got to get that book and read it. Child Guidance 521 says, Let the seasons of family worship be short and spirited. Do not let your children or any member of your family dread them because of their tediousness or lack of interest. When a long chapter is read and explained and a long prayer offered, this precious service becomes wearisome and it is a relief when it is over. That is too sad. And yet every family goes through dry times when it's a relief when worship is over. Isn't that tragic? If that's where you are, don't be discouraged. It can change. It's going to need a new injection of life, and guess who's the one to give the injection? <laughs> it's you <laughs> and me. And so we changed it entirely. Desire of Ages went to the side, not because we didn't love Desire of Ages, but it wasn't appropriate for a six-month-old. No, it wasn't. And so we brought out the felt set, and we began to teach her the stories of Noah and Moses and Jesus, baby Jesus and all these different things. And we sang scripture songs, and she loved family worship. She thought it was the greatest thing once we got our heads together and figured it out. You know, family worship is a great place to teach our children how to worship God here in this environment and how to worship in church. It's kind of like your education ground. And so in family worship, we didn't allow the children to be on the couch and off the couch and on the couch and off the couch and grabbing this and getting a drink and running there. It didn't happen. They knew that, that we need... Is that how we're supposed to be in church? We as adults just get up and down and in and out and... Run. No, no. So we're gonna, where are we going to start this? And so we started it in childhood and we taught them we're worshiping God. We sit still and respectful and reverently, so we would sit them on the couch between us, and we still sang, and we still did the felts, and we did all these different things. They really loved it, but they needed to sit and pay attention. So what happened if they didn't? I won't ask Hannah to tell you, but both children were sent from worship, not downstairs to play, to sit on their bed. And you know, sometimes, parents, the temptation is, okay, so our children sent out of worship, and now we just stop worship, right? No. So sometimes, didn't happen very often, but sometimes one, the other, or even both children were sent from family worship, and Paul and I carried on doing the felts and singing scripture songs, actually in a louder voice, so they knew they were missing out on something really great. And they didn't miss worship, I don't know, maybe two or three times in their whole growing up years, because they didn't want to miss out. We taught them early how it should be, how it should go in the family. And as they get older, you know, we're now going through the Bible together. We've read the whole of Desire of Ages over the last year as a family in family worship. And now we're listening through the Bible. We've just, we're about halfway through Deuteronomy. It's pretty interesting. <laughs> but we're really enjoying it as a family. On the, on the last part of worship, I just want to talk about church worship. Family worship teaches our children how to be in church worship. When we take our children to church, we always went to Sabbath school with our children. Why? Because they're going to learn a whole lot more than what the teacher tells them in Sabbath school. There's a whole lot of education going on around our children in the Sabbath school room. And often we tend to let our guard down because now I'm in church, everything's good. I wouldn't, you know, leave them in town unob unobserved. I would be there. But in church, hey, it's no biggie. 
I'm not going to begin to tell you the things that go on in Sabbath school rooms, but if you really want to know, come and ask me personally. I'll tell you some personal examples of what has happened in the Sabbath school room. So we were always there. And you know what? If you end up going to Sabbath school with your children consistently, guess what? Guess who will become the teacher? You will. And don't go, oh, but I teach them all week and now I've got to teach them. No, pray. I just praise God for the privilege not only to teach my own children, but to teach other children too. So that's a great opportunity. Church, when our children go to church, how do we teach them to sit still and quiet? You bring their whole toy box along. No, we don't bring their whole toy box along. Maybe one or two little quiet books, felt books, maybe a picture. I used to photocopy the picture from the week of the My Bible First lessons because our children did them for their devotions. We did them in family worship. And then they had it at Sabbath school. They really got a dose of it all week. By the end of the week, they really knew about Moses striking that rock and why he did it. No questions asked. And so then My Bible First had pictures. I would photocopy the pictures, and so the children would color Moses striking the rock on that Sabbath as they were in church, and then they would give it to this old person or to that person. They had, there was a purpose in what they were doing. Something we never did, we never took them to the playroom. I mean, sorry, the mother's room. You know, friends, our children are really smart, and a baby not a year old yet will know that if it messes up, if it fusses in the church, it gets to go play in the playroom. Try it out and see. You'll find out it's the truth. And they, so we never took them there. They knew if they were being taken out of church, it wasn't because it was, we were going to go have a party. They knew they were in trouble. <laughs> Not a good idea. So anyway, I'm going to finish on this, on this PowerPoint number one. Have you heard the book about the book, Having a New Kid by Friday? There's Having a New Teen by Friday. I don't, you know, today's Thursday, so we may be stretching it to say you can have a new family by Friday, but for sure by the following one, no question, if you go home, if you walked out of here now, saw no more, heard no more of family retreat, but having personal devotions, family worship, and church worship, and how to do that, your family would be different. Do you believe me? There is no question. I challenge you, please, the most important thing that we can do as parents in our families is teach our children how to connect their hearts to heaven. And then our job is half as difficult as it is when we don't do that. So, PowerPoint number two. PowerPoint number two, you're going to go, oh no. <laughs> I don't know how to say this nicely, but I'm just going to have to say it. PowerPoint number two, the most powerful parenting thing next to family worship is schedule. Woohoo! You're so excited. <laughs> I just knew it. I want to equate schedule to the eyesight that Eric didn't have because those two are very closely equated. You know, you can go through life without one, just like Eric is going through life blind, but oh, how much easier it would be if he could see, especially doing stuff like Everest. And he went on to climb the highest peaks of all seven continents in the world. And he's done a whole lot more besides. And he's, he's defying the laws of blindness, I guess. But how much easier when we go through our life as parents with our eyes open because we have a schedule in the family and we know what's coming our way rather than shooting in the dark, not knowing where our next foot is going to land. And we're victims of circumstance because we can't see ahead what's meant to happen because we've got no idea because we didn't schedule it. And nobody's thrown anything at me yet, so I guess I'll just keep talking about schedule. <laughs> Anybody ever experienced blindness here? Anybody ever tried out blindness? As a student nurse back in my early, no, early late teens, the, the nurse, nursing tutor, when they were talking about the eyes and the, and the, you know, the vision and everything else, and we were doing the AMP on it, she said, now I've got an exercise class for you to do this afternoon. You need to get in pairs. One of you is going to be blindfolded, not with just like a, you know, a band, like a, a scarf or something, but proper, make it look like you've had an injury. And the other person is going to lead that person wherever you want to take them. And they are going to experience for the afternoon what it's like to be blind, and you're going to experience what it's like to take care of a blind person. So guess who got to be blindfolded? My friend, I mean, she was mean. She, she took me down the street to the bus stop. This is England, so there's buses everywhere. She got me on the bus. We went to town. We went up the escalators, down the escalators, up the stairs, down the stairs. I had to buy things, do all kinds of stuff, whilst blindfolded. It was, this is a pun, but it was a real eye-opener. And it seriously was what it was, we would be like to be without vision. So I kind of know... 
And yet many of us, and it, and it wasn't fun, by the way, people treated you like you didn't have a brain. I would try to pay for something, and they would talk to her pretending I didn't even exist. That's kind of how it feels for a lot of people who are blind. It, it wasn't very fun, but it was very illuminating as to what this is like. Friends, we don't want to do that in our parenting, do we? What if we just decided, Vivian, what if you just got a, you know, a band of thing for everybody, and everybody in here got blindfolded just for five minutes? And then we had to walk around in here, go to the restroom, do whatever. How would that be? It'd be a disaster, wouldn't it? And we'd be falling over each other, we'd be knocking down all this expensive equipment we've got, it wouldn't be any fun at all. Friends, but we somehow don't get past it in our brains that when we choose to go through our families and through our lives without any kind of a schedule or format in our families, that's what we're doing. We're just going through family life blindfold. And it's, it's just not a smart way to go. There's so many examples I could give, but maybe the best one is, you know, so we raised our children on a schedule. And yesterday, somebody said to me, is that your daughter? And Hannah's running around with this great big sheet of paper. On it are hundreds of words. And all these words are all to do with, you know, there's a young person here, and another one's helping there. And there's a young person on that camera, and this camera, and there's two young people there. And there's, there's young people. It takes about 15 young people a message to get this whole thing live streamed. Hi, folks on the live stream out there to be done. And somebody has to make a schedule. Would you like to do that? <laughs> Hannah has spent... I want to say months on this schedule, figuring out who will be where, for what meeting when, that everything is covered. There's somebody there with batteries in case a battery dies, and they're, they're taking care of that. You've got no idea what you sit here facing me, what's going on behind you. But behind all of that is a schedule. Without it, young people, how would it be to be on the AV team? Wouldn't it be horrible? You wouldn't have a clue where to be when and what to be doing. Your young people value schedule. So I want to encourage you. I hope you do too. Where do we start schedule? The best place to start schedule, believe it or not, is on your knees. It's the only place. God help me. If you're not a schedule kind of a person, God will help you to start. And once you've gotten off your knees, the first place to begin for today is not, or for tomorrow, I'm going to have a schedule as of tomorrow. You've got to start today. And the most significant thing about today that you will do for tomorrow is go to bed on time. I'm not going to get and tell you when that on time time is meant to be. You'll have to figure that out. You're going to need to figure how many hours of sleep that you need and everybody else in your family, by the way. It's no good just you doing schedule and nobody else doing schedule. And then you're going to have to figure out so what time you need to get up. You're going to want to factor in devotions and all those different things and make sure you go to bed because you know the devil loves to trick us into thinking that a few hours late at night won't really matter. But how about when you get to work a few hours late in the morning? Does your employer think it doesn't really matter? No. You end up with no job before you know where you are. So the devil wants us to not worry about what we do at the night because he knows what will happen in the day, right? By the next morning, no time for God. Number one power-packed parenting point, worship. He knows that. So getting to bed, getting up on time. You know, I don't know how else to say this. You figure out when you need to do it and by God's grace and through a lot of prayer... You just need to do it. <laughs> I can't be there to drag you out of bed in the morning. You just need to choose that I will get myself out of this bed, no however hard it is. And tomorrow, I'm going to go to bed a whole lot earlier to make it a whole lot easier to achieve. We know that because we've read about worship, there needs to be a fixed time for morning and evening worship. So you're going to figure out when I need to go to bed so that I know when I need to get up and I'm going to figure out when worship needs to be because here's when everybody has to get out of the door in my house and go to work and school or wherever they go so that you can factor back. And you're going to start finding bedtime is going to be a whole lot earlier than you think, right? In order to be able to get up a whole lot earlier than you probably are to fit in the these things that we need to do. But is it impossible? Nothing is impossible. It is very possible. We can do this by God's help alone. We're going to factor in meal times. How important are meal times? Very, there's a young man there. Very important. And you may say, oh, my kids don't care about schedule. I want to tell you something. Kids care about schedule. They really do. And from infancy up, they need schedule from birth. They need regularity in their meal times. Regularity in eating, we're told in Councils on Diets and Foods, um, page 179, regularity in eating is of vital importance. There should be a specified time for each meal. 
Oh, moms, I know I'm stepping on your toes, so I'm stepping on my own. It's a challenge to get that thing on the table and then to do it at the same time every day. We're also told if we're going to air five minutes one way or the other, be five minutes early rather than five minutes late. It should be on time. And you know, when it is, you haven't got fussy infants who are crying because they don't know when the next meal's coming. And you haven't got teenagers raiding the refrigerator because well, I don't know when the next mixed meal's going to come. It's scheduled. It's going to happen in an orderly fashion. It cuts out a lot of uncertainty for our babies and our young people. And then we're going to add, and you see, you're not going to do all this Monday morning when you hit home from family retreat. Hopefully all you'll get around to figuring out Monday is that you've got to get to bed early Monday night so you can get, on, get off the ground on Tuesday with starting about getting up at a decent time. Maybe all you'll do next week is get up when you said you were going to get up. And if you did, you have really achieved a lot. And then you'll start to put in place these other things as you get up and have your time, have your time with God and working out when worship's going to be, working out when your meals are going to be, working out when chore time is. Some people I know don't get to bed because they're doing chores late into the night. Friends, chores stops at family time in our family. Family time is at six o'clock and we don't do ironing and laundry and vacuuming and all that stuff into the evening. It doesn't happen. If it hasn't happened, that's it. Tomorrow's another day. We can take care of it then. But when we tend to kid ourselves, we can do this stuff way into the night, that's when we lose a lot of what we lose in our families and we don't get ourselves into bed. So the devil does not want us to have a schedule. And he knows what a mess our families are when we don't have one. And there's a lot more specific information. There's materials back there. The reason that we don't have a lot on that table is because it's all on Audioverse and it's all on the Restoration website. Download it for free and listen. There's a message there specifically called The Secret of Success. That message is very specific about how to roll out a schedule, even more so than I'm able to be now. So we're going to move into our PowerPoint number three. PowerPoint number three is obedience. That is the third powerful point of parenting that we don't want to miss. And obedience, we're still tying into our climbing theme. And you know, when Eric was climbing Everest, there was something that he would not have gone without. And that was a pair of crampons. And I didn't think to tell Vivian we, I needed crampons up here. Crampons are kind of like, I don't know how to describe it, but you kind of, you strap these things onto your hiking boots or your mountaineer boots, and there's like great big metal teeth in those things. And when you're climbing on ice, you stick those things in the ice and you're solid. You're not going anywhere. Kind of like obedience. It's to stop our children from sliding and falling into the many deceptions the devil has. You know, I know about crampons, or actually I know about not having crampons. I was... 21, I think, maybe 22 at the most, and I had gone backpacking in Switzerland, in Europe, over the mountains with my backpack, youth hosteling, and I'd gone to Zermatt. Anybody been to Zermatt, Switzerland? Okay, yeah, the Matterhorn and the most amazing mountain over there. I wanted to see it, but I wanted to get a, a higher view, and so I decided I was going to climb a mountain called the, the Metalhorn. The metal horn is 11,000 feet. Zermatt sits at five, so it was a 6,000-foot mountain to hike up. But they said you could do it. You didn't need all this gear, and so I went. Now, I, didn't, I wasn't quite as smart as I should have been. I went on my own, and nobody knew I was going because back in the day, I didn't have a cell phone. I was in Europe on my own anyway, so it wasn't like I could tell my parents. And my parents, I think they had a phone by then, but only just. So anyway, I hiked up the metal horn. It was amazing, by the way. Now, my second mistake was I started at about noon. Should have started at about mm, 8 o'clock in the morning, but I hadn't come up with that idea at 8 o'clock that morning. It was only till noon that I thought, this would be a really neat thing to do. So I hiked up and I hiked up, and by about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm almost to the summit of this mountain. And, you know, as you looked at it, there was no snow. What I didn't know was on the back side, which is where I was going to have to go, was a glacier and, a, and an ice field. I didn't know that. So I'm heading up, and now I'm just coming to this ice field thinking, okay, I've got to get over this thing, because, I mean, you know, when you've gotten that far, you've got, to, you've got to get to the top, right? You can't not get to the top. So I was determined I was going to get to the top of this thing, and there was somebody hiking down, and he's like, you've got to get, out and get a move on, this guy said, because it's getting late, and you, you don't want to be up here when it's dark, and I'm like, I know, I know. So I did get to the top of this mountain. It was the most incredible thing. You know, 6,000 feet above the valley floor, there was Zermatt down there, like little ants, you know? You just, just sort of see, there was the Matterhorn, incredible experience. 
And so I'm like, I allowed myself 20 minutes to eat whatever and to get off the, the summit of that mountain. And so I'm coming down, and I'm kind of in a hurry because I want to get down before nightfall. And I got to that ice field, and it was pretty steep, and I slipped. And I fell onto my face, or well, onto my front, and I began to slide down that ice field. And I thank God I managed to flip over onto my back so I could at least see where I was going. <laughs> I mean, maybe you didn't want to see where you were going, but I kind of wanted to anticipate what was coming next. And I'm going, it was about 150 to 200 feet sliding down. And, I'm, and I can't demonstrate fully, but I, had my, I was digging in my, my hiking boots as hard as I could, and I was pushing my hands as hard as I could, and I couldn't stop. And it was getting faster and faster and faster. And I tell you, my heart rate was, whoo! And it was a God thing. Otherwise, I shouldn't even really be here. But just, just toward the edge, at the bottom of this ice field, on, on this one side, was a rock kind of like this. And as the heat of the sun hits the rock and the, and the snow melts off the rock, the warmth kind of filters down, so the snow around the edge of the rock is a little softer. And as I'm digging in my heels as hard as I could, I hit the snow just before my feet hit the rock at speed, and my feet dug into the snow, and I stopped. And when I had the courage to stand up, and I was really shaking, I looked over the edge to a death fall. And if I hadn't have smashed myself into the rock, I would have been over the edge. Guys, we need crampons. And I told myself I would never do that again without the right gear. <laughs> And so I gingerly got myself off of the ice field. It was just a little bit further to go. And then, and I guess that was probably about 1,000 foot of elevation down by this point. And I ran the next 5,000 feet of elevation down that mountain. <laughs> so that I got down before nightfall hit. And I just thought, whoo, and I was really kind of shaky. And I thought, whoo, that was something I will never forget. And as I began to realize how obedience is the, are the crampons of our life, and what we need to teach our young people, it reminded me of that whole story. And friends, we need it because without teaching obedience to our children, it is a death fall. Their feet will slip off of the path that the devil wants them to slip off of, and there is nothing to grip them on. So we need to teach them obedience. It is vitally important. Child Guidance, uh, page 82, says, The mother's work should commence with the infant. She should subdue the will and temper of the child and bring its disposition into subjection. Teach it to obey, and as the child grows older, relax not the hand. We start when they are very, very little. And as they get older, guess what? We don't go, oh, well, I told them all that when they were little. What do we do? We teach them all over again in their teenage years that this is what they need. Yes, they still need to make their bed, and they still need to be courteous and respectful and all the rest of these things. We continue on. It says on page 82 of Child Guidance, obedience to parental authority should be inculcated in babyhood and cultivated in youth. In babyhood, what does that mean? Well, and I'm not going to get into all kinds of disciplinary methods up here right now. This is not really the place for me to do that. But, but to say that, you know, so when our children were infants, and one of the first things an infant will do is they'll kind of arch the back, you know, to let you know that they didn't want to be where they are and what you're doing. And if where they were and what you were doing was perfectly safe and fine, we would restrain the arching back and say, no, no, no. Let them know. No, we didn't beat on them, but we let them know, uh-uh, you need to be doing this and be happy to be doing what we see you need to be doing. We start when they're little, and it moves on as they get older. Here is another, another um, point. Child Guidance 92, one precious lesson which the mother will need to repeat again and again is that the child is not to rule. Give them nothing for which they cry, even if your tender heart desires ever so much to do this. For if they gain the victory once by crying, they will expect to do it again. The second time, the battle will be more vehement. What do you think? So when they want their diaper changed and they cry, we can't change the diaper? No, let's get real. I have to cover that, because somebody will go out of here saying, oh, she said. No, she did not say. We have to be reasonable. But I would say this. Even with our infants, when they are crying to be nursed and fed, do we need to feed them when they are fussing to be fed? We don't. That doesn't mean you don't feed your infant, I'm going to clarify. But we would work with our little ones until they would calm down and stop fussing, and then I would nurse. It didn't take much for them to realize we're not going to throw a fit and then we get to eat. Because if they do it when they're a few months old, what is it like when they're teenagers? 
I can tell you, it wouldn't be funny. <laughs> Not nice at all. We start with them as they are little. Nothing for which they cry. Because if we don't, then when they throw their tantrums, it's one thing when they're two, and we've got to learn how to deal with that. But when they're teenagers, do teenagers throw tantrums? Yes, they do. Do adults throw tantrums? Yes, they do, don't we? <laughs> don't we? We need to learn how to have that self-control. Proverbs 13, 24 says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth betimes. Spare the rod, spoil the child. We, and I don't need to get into all the versions of what that rod is, but something that I would really encourage you to read is chapter 45 of Child Guidance entitled with love and firmness if you just read that chapter in, in my book of child guidance that chapter that chapter is so do dog-eared the pages have been looked at so often because i don't have humanly the natural balance between love and firmness but that is what we need love isn't love if there's no firmness in it it's indulgence and and it will lead to all kinds of misery that we don't want our children to experience i'm going to move on to powerpoint number four powerpoint number four you know, we've been talking basic stuff, right? But sometimes there's so many things we think we're, we we're needing to do is in our parenting that we don't boil it down to the basics. And I'm boiling it right down to the basics. Number four, honesty. We need to teach honesty. Honesty in, in parenting would be like the oxygen of climbing. Now, when you're doing this stuff, this guy doesn't have an oxygen mask. But when you saw the pictures of Eric on Everest, he was all masked up, kind of looked like he was, you know, a firefighter or something. He wasn't. He had oxygen. Oxygen is vital when you're that high up. Everest is at 29,000 feet. And at 26,000 feet, the oxygen levels are really low. In fact, they call it the death zone. Anybody want to go to the death zone? <laughs> anybody been there? <laughs> nope, I don't think there's anybody here that has. I haven't either. But in the death zone, at sea level, there's 98% oxygen in your blood at sea level. When you're in the death zone on Everest, there is 40% oxygen available in your blood. You are seriously oxygen depleted. And, you know, our world is a bit like the death zone. Our world's kind of the death zone of the universe, isn't it? It's where the, sin, the sin's hanging out, and we want to get rid of it. We need the oxygen that this world needs, and honesty is kind of like the pure oxygen that we need to breathe in this world like they do in the death zone. Child Guidance 151 says, Parents should be models of truthfulness, for this is the daily lesson to be impressed upon the hearts of the child. Undeviating principles should govern parents in all the affairs of life especially in the education and training of their children. If you want your child to be truthful, be truthful yourself. There is a challenge for every one of us as parents. If we're running into dishonesty in our children, take a look and ask the Lord to humble your heart and show you what, is, what are they seeing for this dishonesty that may be taking place. You know, we're talking not necessarily about big things initially, little things. I was, I was contemplating this recently. I was sweeping the floor um, because we share the chores. Now the children have learned how to do them. We've taken some of them back, and we share them between us. And I was sweeping the kitchen floor. And as I was going past the refrigerator, I had the thought, you know, if a child sweeps the floor, and they go past the refrigerator, and those bits just kind of go under the refrigerator, and then they carry on, is that really honest sweeping? No, I had the thought, I had never had this thought until a few weeks ago, and I said to my children, so, I'm just curious to know, have you ever swept the bits under the stove or the refrigerator? And what do you think they said? <laughs> they both gave me the same answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you did? When was that? Oh, and, and, and we laugh at this in our family, but whenever they do anything like that, it was always a long time ago. I mean, years ago. <laughs> so you may want to ask yourself and your children a few questions. Now, you know, I didn't go around every day saying, did you sweep it under the refrigerator? No, and they lied. But did you sweep the floor? Yeah, well, yeah, they did sweep the floor, but sometimes, and they said, they claimed that it wasn't very often that that happened, but it has happened at least once in both of their lives that the bits just kind of found their way under the refrigerator because it was easier than sweeping them up, so it would seem. So there's one example. You know, what about sneaking food? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. 
But sneaking food out of the refrigerator, the word sneaking, friends, is a dishonest word right there. If you're going to say, Mom, I'm just getting this out of the refrigerator, I know it's not mealtime, and I know we do the five hours and nothing between deal, but Mom, I'm... that's not being dishonest. Now, she's still going to deal with it, probably, but sneaking anything is dishonest. Did you brush your teeth? Ah! <laughs> Did they brush their teeth? Ask the question. <laughs> Find out, because uh, sometimes a big, a big smile can be deceiving. Did you, you know, what about reading when the light should be out? Young people, maybe I'm t treading on your pet thing. Or breaking something and not telling anybody. We told our children from the youngest age, if you break it, tell us. You'll be in only half the trouble you would be in if you don't tell us. Because guess what? We're going to find out anyways. Honesty is the best policy. And if we work with our little ones when they are little, we won't run into half of what we're going to encounter when they get older. Because when the dishonesty moves from the bits under the fridge, it moves to things like not telling about who you really associate with and what those influences are that you're experiencing as a result of that. Not telling about where you've been on your computer or your phone and what music you listen to, what relationships you're getting involved in. You know, Adam and Eve hid themselves. They didn't want to be up front with God and tell him what had gone on. They hid themselves. It gets more serious as our young people get older. And then we end up with our young people being compulsive liars. And we never know when anything is truthful. And if we're not sure if we can trust them, then we end up not being able to give them the privileges we want to give them. But if our young people are being honest and upright, don't deny them the privileges that they deserve. If they've proved themselves, give them those privileges. We're going to talk more tonight about some of these things. But we need, as well as wanting our young people to be honest, we need to be willing to hear what they have to tell us. Because sometimes in their honesty, if we're truthful, we will freak out when they tell us what they're going to tell us. You did what? You, you Help us all. And we just kind of lose it. Parents, if we do that, can we be surprised that they won't come to us in honesty? Now, it's not right. But we need, to, we need to create the atmosphere that opens up their hearts to be honest. And your young people are never too old to tuck them in at night and sit on the edge of the bed and say, so, what's happening? Because often that's what it takes. And even then, it might not be the first or second night, but eventually they begin to open up and tell you what's in their hearts. And when they do, take a deep breath and don't lose it. Go to the Lord and you can lose it with him. <laughs> you can tell him it all and then you can deal with it. So we need to help them. Last, last PowerPoint, number five, companionship. All these things are powerful tools in our hands as we raise our children. And there's many others that don't make the list because of lack of time. But companionship, companionship, again, kind of like the ice axe. We don't have one here. But a typical mountaineer's ice axe, on the one end, it's got a really sharp point, kind of curves this way. On the other end, it's a blunt-ended thing. And there's a reason for that. When Eric was climbing Everest, they drilled this over and over and over again. Here's what you do. When you're on some of these traverses where you're all roped together, and if the rope goes tight, that means a man is down. That man could be falling to his death. And so these guys had to learn that as soon as the rope went tight, they threw themselves to the ground with their ice axe to their chest, the blunt end, of course, otherwise they'd be a goner, and they threw themselves into the snow in the hopes that the weight of their bodies and all of them in combined would stop the rope for the person that was falling. And Eric himself did fall. He didn't fall to his death, obviously, because he's done a lot of other things, but he did. That, that ice axe is a vital thing. Our companionship to our children is a vital thing in this world. Child Guidance 24, the mother, by almost constant association with her children, especially during their tender years, must always be their special instructor and companion. That is the beautiful privilege that God has given us, to be the instructor and the companion to our children, there by their side, with them seeing them through the, the, the good things and the tough things of life, but we're there. We're part of their world. And in then, just to finish, right here, Child Guidance 114, fathers and mothers, do you realize the importance of the responsibility resting on you? Do you allow your children to associate with other children without being present to know what kind of education they are receiving? Do not allow them to be alone with other children. Give them your special care. That is a very serious statement right there. And if you adopt that in practical terms into your life, 
you will be different than a lot of people around you and you will operate in a different fashion. I know because we did that and it wasn't always easy but I don't regret it for one moment. We went where our children went so when they wanted to visit with friends, we visited with those friends or those friends visited with us and we were always together. And I know Tom and Elaine talked in the message and I don't remember which one about no closed doors. You know, you go over to visit family and then your children all trot off to the bedroom, kaplunk, and the door shut. Now what? No way. God would not give me a minute's peace until I went and opened that door and either became a part of it or even in someone else's home, bring those children out so that because the devil loves closed doors. And if it's not a physical closed door, when you see your little ones and, and they're whispering to another, we didn't allow whispering when our children were little. If it couldn't be spoken out, it couldn't be spoken at all because the devil likes to do that kind of stuff. He's a master at it. That means that when our children were a lot younger, we did not just give them the phone and they went off and spoke to their friends in another room on the phone. It was on speakerphone. We all got to hear what was being discussed. And if you're not sure, even if they're into their late teens, it's okay. You can put it on speakerphone until you're comfortable that you don't need to do that anymore for the sake of everybody, not just your kids, but there's the other ones too. We, we, we're all doing different things. Our children have different understandings. Samson, and there's not time to read it, but do you know what happened to Samson? His parents started off, they were doing power-packed parenting. They had all of these principles in place and she was eat a certain way and he couldn't do certain things. And it all went wrong, didn't it? And Tom talked about Samson last night. What happened, do you know? Let me read this very little bit. Perry Johnson Prophets 5, 568. But under the influence of wicked associates, he let go the hold upon God, which is man's only safeguard. It was his associations. I don't know how that happened. I don't know how his parents somehow, I know he kind of nagged them and nagged them until they finally kind of just, it seems like when you read it in exasperation, gave up and just kind of let him go with his wicked associates. Friends, we need to, be involved in who our young people are involved in. Keep them with us, by our side. This evening, we're going to talk about when that changes. But don't change it too soon. We're going to share with you. No, our children, you'll see them. They're in different places here a lot of the time, but it hasn't always been that way. It changed over time, but we have been their companions throughout of it all. It's a vitally important part of this whole parenting thing. So why didn't I talk about all the other things I could have talked about? because there wasn't time. <laughs> so, and I prayed about the five most powerful, significant things. These are the five that God put on my heart. They were worship, kind of like the lifeline to our experience and our young people's, teaching them how to have worship, schedule so that we can see what we're doing in our family's life and have a plan, not be fumbling in the dark. Obedience, keeping us on the straight and narrow, not slipping off the path into the devil's traps that he has. Honesty, that we can breathe that pure, honest atmosphere of life and companionship, being right by their side in every situation. I'm going to close with this one statement from Signs of the Times, 1881. The work of parents is continuous. It should not be laid hold of vigorously for one day and neglected the next. Many are ready to begin the work, but are not willing to pers persevere in it. They wish to see children correct their faults and form right characters at once, reaching the mountain top out of bound, and not by successive steps. And because their hopes are not immediately realized, they become disheartened. Do you get disheartened? Want it to happen just like that overnight? Did this guy, you know, did he just say, I'm going to be a climber, and the next thing we know, there he is? Did it happen like that? Did Eric just decide at 16, you know what, I think I'm going to try rock climbing, let's do Everest? No, friends, it didn't work that way. By successive steps, as we seek to tackle our Everests with the tools that God has given us, and we realize that by his grace, nothing is impossible. We can achieve that. Do you believe that? Why don't we come to our knees in prayer, and then you're going to have three or four minutes of time just to contemplate, to talk amongst yourselves, if that helps you, as you think through some of these different points. Oh, Father, we thank you that with you nothing is impossible. Yet, Father, so often our eyes tend to look at ourselves and when we do that, 
we see all the impossibilities that there are to be seen. And so, Father, I pray as we contemplate these five powerful points of parenting and how we can really and practically implement them or maybe re-implement them into our lives and families, I pray that you would help us not to be tripped up by looking at ourselves and what we can do or what we have achieved or not achieved of the past. I pray that you would help us to keep our eyes focused on you because all things are possible through you. Father, I pray that for those that are here for the very first time, that it's a lot of information as they come here to, to chew on. I pray that you would particularly be close to them and help them to see what it is you would have them to move forward doing, what specific points. And as they sit, and as we each sit and contemplate what you would have to say to our hearts right now, I pray that you would encourage us to move forward into the possibilities that we have in you. And I thank you for this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.